Introduction Hello and welcome to today's video where we'll be exploring the psychology of false confessions. Have you ever wondered why someone would confess to a crime they didn't commit? The reality is that it happens more often than you might think. In fact, research shows that approximately 25% of DNA exonerations involved false confessions. Let me share a story with you. In 1989, five teenage boys were accused of brutally raping a woman in New York's Central Park. Despite a lack of physical evidence and inconsistencies in their confessions, all five were convicted and sentenced to prison. It wasn't until 2002, when DNA evidence exonerated them, that the truth came out. Their confessions had been coerced and were completely false. This case is just one example of the devastating consequences of false confessions. So, why do innocent individuals confess to crimes they didn't commit? Let's take a look at some of the psychological tactics used by police and interrogators to elicit confessions. Firstly, there's the read technique, which is a commonly used interrogation method that involves a series of accusatory and confrontational tactics. This method is designed to make the suspect feel as though they have no other option but to confess. It can involve lengthy interrogations, withholding food and water, and even physical intimidation. The read technique has been widely used by police and interrogators for decades, and it's based on the assumption that people will eventually confess if they are confronted with enough evidence and pressure. This technique involves a three-phase process, the factual analysis, the behavioral analysis, and the interrogation. During the factual analysis phase, the interrogator gathers as much information as possible about the crime and the suspect. They may use this information to develop a profile of the suspect and to identify any weaknesses or vulnerabilities that could be exploited during the interrogation. The behavioral analysis phase involves observing the suspect's behavior during the interview and looking for signs of deception or guilt. Interrogators may use a variety of tactics during this phase, such as asking the suspect to repeat their story multiple times, looking for inconsistencies in their statements, and analyzing their body language and facial expressions. Finally, during the interrogation phase, the interrogator will use a series of accusatory and confrontational tactics to elicit a confession. These tactics can include yelling, threats, lies, and even physical intimidation. The goal is to create a sense of hopelessness and convince the suspect that they have no other option but to confess. Unfortunately, this technique can lead to false confessions, especially in cases where the suspect is particularly vulnerable, such as juveniles or individuals with mental health issues. False confessions can occur when a suspect feels overwhelmed, confused, or pressured into confessing, even if they didn't commit the crime. In some cases, individuals may falsely confess to a crime simply because they want the interrogation to end. Research has shown that the read technique and other accusatory interrogation methods can increase the risk of false confessions. Alternative interrogation methods, such as the peace model used in the United Kingdom, focus on building rapport and trust with the suspect, rather than using confrontational tactics. These methods have been shown to reduce the risk of false confessions and improve the accuracy of police investigations. The use of accusatory and confrontational tactics during police interrogations can lead to false confessions, which can have devastating consequences for innocent individuals. It's important for police and interrogators to be aware of the risks associated with these techniques and to consider alternative methods that are based on building rapport and trust with the suspect. By doing so, we can work towards a justice system that is fair and accurate for all. Another tactic is the use of false evidence. Interrogators may lie and tell the suspect that they have DNA evidence or eyewitness testimony linking them to the crime. This can create a sense of hopelessness and convince the suspect that they might as well confess, even if they didn't do it. The problem is that these tactics can lead to false confessions, which can have dire consequences. When someone confesses to a crime they didn't commit, it can lead to a wrongful conviction and a lifetime of consequences, including a criminal record, loss of employment opportunities, and even a loss of freedom. But the impact of false confessions goes beyond just the legal consequences. False confessions can have a profound psychological impact on the individuals who make them. In many cases, individuals who falsely confess may experience feelings of shame, guilt, and confusion. They may struggle with the knowledge that they confessed to a crime they didn't commit, and they may also face criticism and judgment from others who believe they are guilty. Furthermore, false confessions can undermine an individual's trust in the justice system. If someone is wrongly convicted based on a false confession, it can make them feel as though the system is rigged against them and that they will never be able to clear their name. Research has also shown that false confessions can have long-term effects on mental health. 
individuals who have made false confessions may experience symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and depression. They may struggle with feelings of mistrust, paranoia, and isolation. It's important to remember that false confessions are not always the result of intentional misconduct by police or interrogators. In some cases, false confessions may be the result of mental illness, coercion, or other factors outside of the individual's control. Ultimately, the use of false evidence and other manipulative tactics during police interrogations can have serious consequences for innocent individuals. It's crucial for police and interrogators to be trained in ethical and effective interrogation techniques, and for the justice system to have safeguards in place to prevent wrongful convictions based on false confessions. By working towards a justice system that is fair and accurate for all, we can help to prevent the devastating impact of false confessions on innocent individuals and their families. Research has shown that the psychological impact on individuals who falsely confess can be significant. They may experience feelings of guilt and shame, as well as anxiety and depression. In some cases, false confessions have even been linked to suicidal thoughts and behaviors. For example, a study published in the journal Law and Human Behavior found that false confessions were associated with symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder PTSD, including intrusive thoughts, nightmares, and avoidance behaviors. In addition, individuals who falsely confess may experience feelings of shame and guilt, which can be particularly challenging to overcome. They may struggle with the knowledge that they confessed to a crime they did not commit and may face ongoing criticism and stigma from others who believe they are guilty. This can lead to feelings of isolation and alienation, further exacerbating the psychological toll of the false confession. Other research has linked false confessions to increased rates of anxiety and depression. A study published in the Journal of Forensic Psychiatry and Psychology found that individuals who falsely confess may experience ongoing symptoms of anxiety, such as nervousness and worry, as well as feelings of depression, such as sadness and hopelessness. Unfortunately, the psychological impact of false confessions can sometimes be severe enough to lead to suicidal thoughts and behaviors. A study published in the Journal of Interpersonal Violence found that individuals who falsely confess may be at increased risk of suicide, particularly in cases where the confession led to a wrongful conviction and imprisonment. Overall, the psychological impact of false confessions cannot be underestimated. It is important for the criminal justice system to recognize the potential harm of using manipulative interrogation techniques and to take steps to prevent false confessions from occurring in the first place. By doing so, we can help to ensure that innocent individuals are not forced to endure the devastating consequences of false confessions. Conclusion So, what can we do to prevent false confessions from happening? One solution is to train police and interrogators in alternative interrogation techniques that are based on building rapport and empathy. These techniques focus on developing a relationship with the suspect and encouraging them to tell the truth, rather than using accusatory tactics. Another solution is to implement policies that protect the rights of suspects, such as requiring interrogations to be recorded and ensuring that suspects have access to legal counsel throughout the interrogation process. The psychology of false confessions is a complex issue, but it's one that we need to address in order to prevent wrongful convictions and protect the rights of all individuals. Thank you for watching, and I hope this video has inspired you to learn more about this important topic.